everyone has a choice that they're gonna make. A choice to compete, a choice to live this lifestyle, and if you're gonna do it, I think that there are ways to do it just a little bit safer. To understand disease processes like chronic traumatic encephalopathy, I think it's first understanding the basic fundamentals of what we think is the best evidence behind chronic traumatic encephalopathy. So just to define it, chronic traumatic encephalopathy is a neurodegenerative condition, meaning it gets worse over time. Usually it's seen in athletes that are exposed to repetitive head impacts, and that's the key word. You wanna underline it, star it. All the best data suggests that repetitive head impacts over a period of time are the driving force behind CTE. The leading evidence behind CTE is what are called subconcussive hits. Below the threshold of a concussion, not enough maybe to cause symptoms, but it's those repetitive head impacts over time that we think lead to this neurodegenerative condition. The big thing I want people to know is that just because you have a concussion, it doesn't mean that you're gonna develop CTE down the road. And a common way that I describe CTE is if you think about a car driving down a road and there's a big pothole and the car drives over that pothole, tire will pop. So think of that as your concussion. You have immediate symptoms, right? The way I think about subconcussive hits is you have smaller potholes in the road and the car drives over every day. And then over time, the wear and tear causes that tire to pop. Typically, people will see behavioral changes, usually in their 40s or so, where they have profound behavioral changes, more agitation, aggression, impulsivity, and then from there, cognitive decline will start to happen. We know that MMA is a violent sport. When we watch football and we watch the Super Bowl, we know that people are gonna get hit at every play. We understand these things. And I think the way that we change the game is ultimately gonna come with one, awareness, Two, knowing the evidence really, really well. Three, coaches taking ownership of sparring, how frequently it's being done, the intensity of the sparring, what the practice habits look like. And we really change the game by understanding that the longer one goes in their career competing, even after they're out of their prime, there are these risks, right? It's repetitive head impacts over a period of time, the cumulative effect of these impacts that are the driving force behind CTE. It's the main thing that we know at this point in time. So if we know that, we need to take that knowledge and apply it, and maybe fighters will start to say, hey, I'm gonna end my career at a good point and not continue to persist into their 40s with declining health. So I think those are some of the things that we can do at this point in time. All right. Good, find your motion, find your motion. I have started a striking program at Rivers Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu in Lawrence, Kansas. Now in this program, we are in our infancy. So we are not even sparring yet, but it is my intention to develop this program with protocols in place. I, I really want there to be an awareness. As a fighter myself, and I was kind of from an old school sort of thing, there was always that idea is that you, the harder you spar in the gym, the harder you work in the gym, the easier the fight is, which I did not find to be true. But, <laughs> um, but you know, at times you definitely wanted to up your intensity. So do, is there a way to tailor that within a gym to have the sparring hard without risking brain health? Yeah, that's a really good question, you know, and I think there's that fine line where you can spar and make it tough, you know, good sparring. You spar with partners that you trust because you don't want someone that's really going to look for a knockout blow, especially if you're training for a high level fight because you're going to risk, you know, serious injury. So the way we can spar harder is by putting more of an emphasis on footwork, head movement, defense, really trying to, you know, work on technique more than anything else because you know, that knockout intensity that comes from fighting a professional fight, that's always gonna be there. But if you do that in training, you really do put yourself at a much higher risk so that you're not gonna go into the fight 100%. If I wanted to create a safer sparring environment, even people who aren't fighters, is there anything you could theorize on? Absolutely, and I think more gyms should be asking these kinds of questions, you know, especially because sparring etiquette, if you think about it that way, it starts from day one, you know, the first time someone's gonna spar, you really wanna teach them what does it mean to be a good training partner? Flow sparring is really good, working on technique, working on landing in a controlled fashion. 
So that way you're working more on precision technique more than anything else. And you emphasize that. And I think that more monitoring early on when people are just starting out to kind of say, okay, you know, that's a little bit beyond that 60% that we just talked about, how about coming down, bring it back down a little bit, start working that head movement a little bit more, start working your jab, right? So taking a notch back and focusing more on the technique, I think is where the emphasis should be. And a common question I get asked is about headgear. Do you wear headgear in sparring or not? Headgear really does not stop the rotational force of the brain turning inside your skull, right? So your brain is surrounded by cerebrospinal fluid, which is a shock absorber. And so your brain is constantly moving. Every time you get punched, you take a whiplash injury, it's back and forth, right? So it's not stopping that, but it will prevent superficial cuts and injuries. So if a fighter's training for a fight, of course, I'm going to tell you, yes, wear the headgear because the once you get a cut, that's then going to prevent you from fighting, you know? But having said that, the bigger headgear, I think, gives a false sense of protection. And also big gloves, you tend to throw harder, you tend to focus less on head work and foot movement. So sometimes taking that off and keeping a controlled environment, I actually think can be more beneficial for controlled sparring purposes. You know, when we fought in small gloves or we sparred in small gloves, it was don't hit so hard to the head, hit hard to the body. But in big gloves, go for it. And that seems to be counter to what you're saying in a lot of ways, huh? You know when you got hit, you know that, oh man, that was a clean hit. He could have knocked me out of here to put some power on that. You know, you know when, when you get hit, but we just, we're not taking time off each other's clock by going hard to each other's head. We're, we're teammates. I'm gonna save my power for the fight. I don't wanna no try to knock out my training partners, but I feel like at the end of my career, I was training with people who just wanted to like, hit me really hard and my friends were saying like you got to just hit him hard back and then they'll stop like i don't want to hit him hard back like you know i care about them too sort of like <laughs> that's not me like i can't do that no there was there were times definitely when i was preparing for one of my ufc fights where i got dropped hard in preparation for that fight and then dropped again afterwards and the coach was like that's it you're done so they did watch yeah. sometimes which is like you can see that the fighter is just not going to be able to perform there's a place for toughness, obviously. This is a combat sport, but there's also a place for mitigating risk and mitigating injury and taking the, uh, the appropriate amount of time to heal. The most common head injury that people should be familiar with is what's called MTBI or mild traumatic brain injury. And that term is interchangeable with the word concussion. And there are different degrees of severity when it comes to concussion, like any head injury. Some patients will suffer symptoms of a concussion, which can be most commonly headaches, sensitivity to light, nausea, difficulty with balance, concentration, the way you process information, and sleep can also be fragmented. You can also have bouts of depression and anxiety that are associated with ongoing symptoms of a concussion. And if a concussion persists for months, there's something called persistent post-concussive syndrome. So it's really important to take these symptoms seriously and seek help. Right, so a coach's role is not just in the gym watching them and watching their symptoms, but it's actually post-fight is insanely important too. Like they, they need to monitor how a fighter is behaving after a fight as well. Post-fight, a lot of fighters are gonna have medical suspensions, right? Depending on the severity of the injury, how much head trauma they took. Coaches, I think the big job is to make sure that the fighter is, uh, you know, maintaining that medical suspension and I'm not looking for any loopholes to get out of that early. I'm taking that seriously. I think that's really important. So once that cage door slams, it's the fighter, his opponent. You have the referee, but oftentimes, you know, referees, you know, they may stop a fight prematurely. They may let a fight go too long. But if your fighter is getting smashed, you know, and there's really no chance of your fighter winning the fight and they're taking a lot of punishment, I think as corner men, we really need to take ownership over our fighter and say, you know, their health really needs to come first. I could see he was exhausted and he wasn't putting his hands up. He wasn't uh, protecting himself well. After a while, I had enough. As his corner, it is my job to make sure that he make it home safe, you know what I'm saying? And if the only question left is how much more damage is your fighter going to take before they lose, barring a miracle, barring that one in a thousand chance Throw in the top. I became involved with the Professional Fighters Brain Health Study while I was a fellow at Johns Hopkins. 
At that time, we made a collaboration with the Cleveland Clinic and they graciously allowed us to be part of the study. And since that time, this team, which involves medical students, residents, and other attendings, have asked a lot of important questions that we think will help to guide fighters in their decision-making processes throughout their career. I'm gonna tell you about three studies from the Professional Fighters Brain Health Study that I've been a part of over the past few years. The first study is going to look at the age of first exposure to fighting and brain health outcomes later in life. What we found was that if fighters started earlier, the hippocampus, a region of the brain that deals with memory and cognition, was disproportionately affected and that was for both active and retired fighters. We also found that among our active fighters, those that started later actually did much better when it came to processing speed and psychomotor speeds. Those retired fighters that started later also did better on a questionnaire called the Barrett Impulsiveness Scales. And those that started fighting later ultimately had much fewer depressive symptoms. Those were the key findings from that particular study. I think this study was particularly important because it touches base on the vulnerability of the developing brain. For the second study that I'm gonna talk about, we focused on the effects of weight class on brain health and professional fighters. What we found was actually quite interesting. We broke our fighters into three weight classes, lightweight, middleweight, and heavyweight. For the heavyweight fighters, we found greater yearly reductions in brain volume and cognitive function. Why we think we, we have these findings is actually due to the brute force of the strikes itself. We saw these findings in the heavier weight classes as opposed to the lighter weight classes. In our lighter weight fighters, we actually found greater yearly reductions on a per fight basis in certain brain areas. Now, when we ask ourselves, why did this happen? We wanted to focus on what's different between lightweight fighters and heavyweight fighters. And heavyweight fighters don't cut that much weight. Lightweight fighters, they tend to do pretty big weight cuts to make their weight class. So we really have these theories about how significant dehydration and weight cutting practices play into some of these per fight findings that we saw. As we know, professional fighters can cut up to 20 pounds, sometimes more, to make their weight class. So we started thinking about morphological changes within the brain and how cushioning from the cerebrospinal fluid may change with these rapid weight cutting practices and how that might then lead to these brain changes on a per fight basis. All of this absolutely needs further work and further research uh, moving forward, but this is one of the theories that we have. For the third study, we focused on sparring rounds, so practice rounds that professional fighters engage in per week, and regional brain volumes. And we actually had a very surprising finding. We found increased, not decreased, caudate volumes, both right and left. And so the caudate is a structure in the brain that's responsible for planning motor movements, reward, memory, learning. Typically when you think about neurodegeneration, you think about shrinking of structures, but in this case we found larger caudate volumes, both right and left. So that was very, very interesting. And the increased number of sparring rounds per week, we didn't actually find decreases in any brain structure. When we asked ourselves, why might this be happening? Do fighters that spar more have a more protective effect than fighters who spar less? I wouldn't take much away in terms of what can I do now from this particular study, just because we weren't expecting these findings, right? To see neuroplastic changes potentially in this particular brain region. And I don't want people to go out there and kind of say, hey, you know, this study showed that there was some growth and this could be a positive finding, so we need to go out and spar more. That's absolutely not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is that sparring can be done. It can be done safely. We just have to understand how to protect our training partners a little bit better and how to protect ourselves a little bit better and really stay disciplined. At this point in time, the only way that we have to diagnose CT is via autopsy. Once someone's passed away, under microscopic evaluation, we're able to look at the deposition of tau protein and where it is within the brain. 
I think it's extraordinarily important that more fighters and athletes pledge their brains because it'll not only help us understand some of the factors potentially that could be contributing to CTE, but also it will give us the evidence that we need and the data we need to hopefully be able to someday diagnose these athletes while they're still living and hopefully be able to come up with more interventions so that we can uh, treat symptoms as they pop up. I personally have had depression and anxiety and also a late in life diagnosis of ADHD. Now I think that the depression and anxiety is actually genetic. However, if it is related to how many times I've been hit in the head and if the late in life ADHD diagnosis is not in fact genetic, but is related to having had a mixed martial arts professional career, I think it's important to get that on the record, that out there. And if they need my brain in order to make things better for the fighters who come after me, take it. I started training when I was very young and it's become a big part of my identity. I think a lot of the qualities that martial arts brings to the table that are embedded in me have really instilled discipline and really helped me to achieve the goals that I have set out for myself in my life. In some ways, I think it's a devil's bargain being a fighter. You don't necessarily know the extent to which you're risking um, until it's too late because fighting is fun. <laughs> it's a really good time. And even when I'm doing commentary, when I'm seeing people get hit, I like it because that's the aim. People are there to do a job. Fighters are there to do a job and you want to see them do it well. Knockouts are exciting. You know, I'm not gonna sit here and say, we don't want people to get knocked out, you know, when we're watching fights, cause that's just untrue. But that being said, I think it's really important to know what you're risking in that. My dad always, you know, was very annoying. He sent me clip outs of articles about boxers getting CTE. I was like, dad, this is not boxing, this is annoying, whatever. But when I started getting headaches, you know, near the end of my career, he was the first thing that I thought of, you know, like, oh, my dad was talking about this thing, like I can't get CTE. And it really influenced me in my decision to end my career. So I think that even if it's annoying, you know, fighters should be made aware. Everyone has a choice that they're gonna make, a choice to compete, a choice to live this lifestyle. And if you're gonna do it, I think that there are ways to do it just a little bit safer, mitigating risk, reducing the number of head impacts that you take, recovering from a concussion, and how seriously we should take that. The other thing I'll talk about is the longevity of one's career. When do you call it quits? These are all adjustments that can be made. The big thing I wanted to do for the sport was to ask these important questions and give fighters the data so that they could make the best decision for their career moving forward. I wanna give fighters the complete autonomy. It's not that I'm saying you should or shouldn't continue to fight, but I wanted to make sure that the data was available so that fighters could then make the best choice.